uh, honor and it's a pleasure for me to uh, speak in this and share you know something that I'm doing uh, I'm not even sure whether it will work okay uh, truth is it's not even completed yet okay but I will share whatever I have built so far okay but before we do that okay just a brief introduction of myself uh, I will skip uh, my work and uh, education because they have got nothing to do with electronics uh, I'm a father and uh, my second child, a uh, son, was born uh, two months ago. And uh, that explains why I, I look a little bit haggard now. And uh, the other thing is uh, I am an re uh, amateur radio operator. Uh, so we belong to the same group as uh, Roland. Yeah. And uh, so one of the things, okay, why we, we actually, why I actually, you know, started doing, doing this CPU, uh, breadboard CPU project is that, you know, actually I wanted to learn how to use a FPGA. Yeah, something like this. Yeah, and what happened is uh, some of the what some of the implementation that is commonly uh, done, okay, is um, people would implement uh, soft core CPU on this FPGA, but uh, for someone like me with zero knowledge on how a CPU actually works, um, I have to go and you know build one myself. Yeah, and and so okay, sorry, my 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 toddler is uh, knocking on the door. Okay. And so, okay, um, I embark on this journey, okay, to find out more about how a CPU works. Okay, so now I shall off my camera and I will um, share my screen instead. Okay. Right, so the very first thing we do, we did, okay, um, in building the CPU was to build a clock. And this, this exercise, okay, sorry, let me uh, just... Uh, okay, uh, just to check, okay, are you guys able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, the screen of a breadboard, right? Yes. Okay, okay, cool. Cool, so, so the very first thing we did, okay, uh, to, to build this uh, CPU uh, was to build a clock. And this, in fact, was a very uh, enlightening exercise for me uh, because it, it, it really taught me how to use a, a triple five timer, you know, in all forms of configuration. So what you see in this picture here, okay, this, this three pieces of uh, silicon uh, or ICs here, okay, it's actually the triple five timer. And they are each uh, configured uh, in a different configuration. From the left to right, we have got the A-stable mode, okay, um, the mono-stable mode, and also the bi-stable mode. Okay, so just to give a very brief uh, English exp uh, ex explanation behind this is, Okay, uh, this A stable mode, right? Okay, is actually used as an automatic timer where it will make okay, this LED you know, blink at a regular interval. And so, what this mono stable uh, configuration does is that it allows the user to specify the clock pulse just by pressing the button here. Right? And finally, we have got one that is the bi stable mode. It is, uh, it is acting as a switch. And what it really does, okay, is it allows the user to toggle between the automatic pulsing and the manual pulsing, right? And so, so this circuit here, you see, is not yet complete, okay? Because there's, uh, you know, some need of other circuit, you know, to allow this toggling to happen, right? And so this is how the, the circuit uh, roughly looks like, okay? So basically the, the select here is actually the bi stable mode, which allows you to, you know, select um, uh, or rather give a signal, okay, to switch to the automatic pulsing or the manual pulsing. Right. And so, as you can see, okay, there are a few gates already used here. Okay. Um, so, what happened is that for those who uh, are more familiar with uh, digital electronics, uh, you may know that you could actually use universal gates um, to, to represent these gates. And uh, the effect is that you probably will end up using lesser gates, I mean, lesser chips, right? So, I, I, had, I had some video on how it actually would look like. These are all the, um, on the right side is all the logic gates. Right. Okay, so I will skip all this uh, thing, okay, but okay, these are basically, you know, some of the configurations, okay, that, you know, one could use, okay, to represent the various kind of gate just by using one type of gate. Like, for example, using NAND gate, okay, 
you can represent your your and your all your no and whatnot. Yeah. Similarly, you can also use your nor gate to do the same thing. Right. Okay, so with the clock being built, okay, the next thing is um, how do we build the other components, right? Okay, or rather, you know, how do we start connecting the components? Okay, we would have to uh, introduce this concept of a bus. And this bus, okay, is actually a highway. Uh, a highway, um, think of it as a highway where different components could be connected to the same circuit. Like in this illustration here, which I, which I screen grabbed from a YouTube video, okay, is that you have got, you know, the various components, okay, the same eight wires, okay, are connected to component A as an input, and you have another eight wires connected to back to the same wire, right? Uh, and of course, one of the key principles behind all this is that um, there's always a, a load and an enable switch, okay? A load to allow the component to receive information and an enable to, to allow the component to output information, okay? And, and as, you, as you can see, okay, all these, um, all these components are sharing the same uh, connection. And, and because of that, you cannot have two components, uh, you know, giving outputs uh, to this same set of wires. Otherwise, uh, you will get, you know, uh, a, a weird result. Yeah. And so to, to be able to allow, okay, multiple components, okay, uh, in sharing this, uh, this bus, this, this central connection here, we need this thing, a, a clock, to do the synchronization. And that's where the clock actually comes in. Right? And this is uh, actually how a, a bus uh, could look like. So for anyone uh, you know, who uh, might want to embark on this project, uh, a word of advice is that when you buy a breadboard, make sure you buy those uh, where the power rail can be detached. Uh, because I bought, I have initially bought a, a quite a few, okay, they cannot be detached. And as a result, I could not do this. So I had to buy another set. Right. So after we talk about the clock and the bus, the next thing uh, I would like to talk about, okay, is this concept of a D flip-flop. Okay. I mean, ignoring how this whole thing, you know, really works, okay. The, the key principle is that, okay, when you put in a data, the data actually stays okay in this circuit, and it gets output as uh, it gets output, right? And so, in in order to allow this uh, to um, be be more functional, where you could uh, store data, you know, allow it to cycle back to the to the to the same D flip flop, there's a need to introduce a switch where you can uh, load the data or prevent the data to be loaded into this thing. And with that, okay, you effectively get a memory. So how this thing actually works is that, okay, let's say we have a load switch over here and the switch is turned off, right? And assuming that this, this D flip-flop here already contain uh, some data, okay? What happened is that you will end up with um, the following logic, okay? A zero on here, going to a zero to the end gate, which will always give you a zero. Okay. And then we look up here. Okay. This zero here gets inverted into one. And then whatever, whatever data that is in the D flip flop gets recycled back to here. So the output is always that data. Right. So with these two combination, as it goes through the OR gate, you will get back the same data, cycle back to the D flip-flop. And that's how the data stays intact. Right. So if we were to look at, look at it at another state where the load is being turned on, okay, what happens here? What happened here is that, okay, the end that's, ha that's happening here, okay, has a one value here, okay? And whatever value that you're trying to input 
into the D flip flop, okay, through uh through the bus, okay, it can be zero or one. But because it's an end gate, you will always end end up with the value that you're trying to input in. Right. And so because this circuit is, is configured to cycle the original value back to the end gate, right? Okay, but because the load is turned on, the in the 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 inverter will turn this signal into a zero. Okay, so no matter what, whatever that's output in here will be zero. Right? So as this two value goes through the all gate, you will get the new value into this D flip-flop. And that's how you write uh, information into uh, a memory. Right? So you just have to think of uh, today's uh, RAM and, you know, all those other uh, memory uh, solutions that we have. Uh, they are basically, you know, uh, this kind of circuit, okay, but multiplied by many billion times, okay. So this circuit alone, okay, can only store one bit, okay, a zero or a one. Uh, yeah. So in order to like have a one two eight GB or two five six GB uh, uh, stuff, okay, you probably need uh, billions of the this kind of circuit, right? Okay. So as you can see, you could potentially use a uh, discrete logic, okay to build your memory, okay? But of course, to save time, okay, what I do, what I did was that uh, I use this chip, okay, which is the 74LS173, uh, okay? Which essentially is the, is the same kind of uh, logic gate here, okay? But in addition, um, what you have is this output control, okay? But for my current, for my implementation, okay, this output control is always turned on. Yeah, that's because uh, I, I've added LEDs, okay, to allow me to monitor the state of each of the register, each of the bits. Yeah. So then the next question is, okay, if the output is always on, okay, wouldn't you be constantly uh, outputting data into the bus? Right? So to solve that problem, okay, um, okay, by the way, this, these are how all the, all the chips look like. They all look pretty much the same. Right? Um, Okay, let me, I don't think I can see. Okay, this is, uh, yeah. So in order to solve that problem, okay, what I have done is to add a buffer in between there. Okay, so this buffer kind of uh, acts as, uh, as like a floodgate. Okay, so despite the register, you know, uh, constantly outputting uh, information, okay, this buffer is there to stop the data from going to the bus. And that is where the, uh, the enable switch is being connected to. Okay, so if we were to look back at, at the previous, the previous slides, right? Okay, each of the component looks something like this. Okay, we have got eight lines going in, eight lines going out, and we have got the load switch, and we have got the enable switch. Okay, so the load switch, okay, is being implemented on the register itself, the register IC itself. Okay. The enable switch could have the 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 the, the output switch could have been uh, implemented here, but because I need to monitor the state of each of the register, that's why this is always turned on. So to segregate this this output, I use another chip here, which is this seventy four LS two four five, right? And the enable line is connected to this uh, chip itself. Yeah. So we can always monitor, okay, on each of these LED, okay, uh, which are the bits that is turned on. And this enable, once uh, turned on, would allow the information to be uh, released to the bus. Right. So these are just uh, the connection of uh, how this thing look like here, okay. Yep. So to make sense of this, uh, this picture here, right? Um, basically, all those green lines here, all these green lines here, okay, are the uh, registers feeding into the buffer. And at the top of the buffer, the top row of the buffer is where the output is coming out, okay? But of course, you can see these blue lines here. These blue lines here, I'm actually connecting the output, okay? to the input of the registers, okay? The reason why we could do this 
Okay, it's because we have uh, the load and the enable switch. Yeah, we've both turned off, okay. Uh, when this, this eight holes here are connected to the bus, nothing happens to, to this thing here, okay. But with the load turned on, whatever that's on the bus will be copied onto the register here, these two registers here, right? Yeah, and then with the, uh, with the output turned on, okay, what happened is that this, uh, this buffer here will then release what's on the register into the bus. Yeah, and, and so, and so uh, in doing so, right, okay, we do not need to have eight separate lines going in and eight separate lines going out. We just need to have eight lines. And these eight lines, okay, it's, uh, well, I don't know what you call that, duplex line, okay? It allows the input and the output of data. Right, I mean, uh, this is just a, a picture, okay, of uh, what I tried to do, okay, uh, you know, and try try to light up some LEDs in the register. In this case, uh, you can see that it is the the first the first bit that got light up. And what I tried to do was to, um, you know, kind of feed it to a temporary makeshift bus, and with uh, with the other register connected to the same bus, okay, that first bit gets transferred to the next one. Essentially, it, it is a high voltage transferred to the first bit position to the central bus. And then from the central bus, it gets transferred back to the first bit in the second register. And that's how memory gets transferred from one point to another point. Yep. So these are just uh, the other registers that I'm trying to build. Okay, so as we reach this point, okay, I just want to introduce to you, okay, while I do not have the full thing, okay, um, many of the things that I, I'm talking about can be found in this book here, Digital Computer Electronics. And so the, the, the version of the CPU that I was trying to build uh, is this, uh, is this uh, known as SAP1, Simple as Possible 1. So in the latest third edition of this book, okay, it contains... Uh, all the schematics from SAP 1 to SAP 3. Okay, and uh, of course, the, the SAP 3 being the more complex version of the CPU. Yeah, so if you're interested, okay, uh, yeah, please, uh, you know, take a look at this book. Yeah, so I'm going to skip this. Okay, so after the register is being uh, built, okay, the next thing I went on to, to build is the uh, ar arithmetic logic unit, the ALU. Okay, so similarly, okay, uh, because this thing does not have uh, output control, okay, so I had to add the same uh, buffer over here, okay, to allow me to uh, control when the data is to be released to the bus. <coughs> so additionally, what I did was um, I used a two, I used two four-bit adders, okay, so as to combine to eight bits, and in order to combine them together, I had to um, add the carry out, I have to link the carry out to the carry in. And so by combining, combining these two, I essentially have a 8-bit adder. Okay, but just this 2-bit adder is not good enough, right? I mean, it can only add things. So in order to allow it to subtract, okay, what I did was uh, to add this XOR gate right below. Okay, so uh, it, it's, it's fairly simple to implement, okay? All we have to do is just to turn this uh, this uh, second output of the XOR gate, okay, turn it to a high, and what happened is that uh, this whole circuit will function as a subtractor. Right, so uh, this thing actually takes a very long time to, uh, to connect. Okay, so uh, in order for this, this uh, arithmetic logic unit to work, okay, what we had to do was to uh, connect uh, the adders, okay, to the input of the buffer. And then, okay, from the... Just hang on a moment. Let me just take a look at this, huh? <laughs> okay, okay. So in order for this to work, right, we need to connect the registers, okay, to the adders, right? And then the output of the adders, okay, to the buffer. Right, so this is just one register 
to the adder only. And then what we do to the next uh, register was that we wired it to the XOR gates and then from the XOR gates back to the second input of the adder. And that's how we can toggle between adding and subtracting. Yep, and the results, okay, you know, goes out to this buffer over here. Yep, so this is so far what I have, okay. Um, and in order to uh, just hang on, let me see, how do I uh, stop my video? Stop my... Okay, let me see, okay, stop my video. Right, and so uh, what I'm going to do is to show you, okay, what is actually happening, okay, on my uh, build. And with that, I will, I will uh, mute this, this uh, chat and I will go on to the next call. Hello. Okay. Right, just give me a moment, huh? Right. So this is the clock that we, we were talking about, right? And so, okay, whatever you see in this blue thing here is the pulsing of the clock. And the clock line is uh, connected to the registers and it is all connected down to the second register, right? And so in this clock, right, we can actually toggle between manual mode and the automatic mode. So right now it's in the manual mode. As you can see, I can use my hand to do the pulsing instead. And then I can switch it okay, to the automatic mode where you'll pulse itself. Okay, so before this call, I tried to uh, do something to the register and now uh, none of the register lights uh, seems to light up, okay? And so with that, okay, my presentation uh, is done. A round of applause for Xavier. Thank you so much for presenting. <laughs> well, you can continue presenting the next headwear, the completed. <laughs> well, uh, maybe we have a, a time for a couple of questions. You okay to take them, Xavier? Uh, happy to, happy to, yeah. Please. Yeah, anybody? Yes, and on your mic. And, yeah. So I, uh, something just occurred to me while watching this. I mean, I, I've long thought about doing such a thing and it just never <laughs> got around to doing it. Um, it's, it's really cool to sort of build up from uh, much more basic chips than perhaps we're accustomed to using for most things. But uh, the question that comes to mind is you end up spending a lot of time wiring up parallel buses by hand and you're having to select arbitrarily to use eight bits instead of four or 16 or whatever. Um, for most communication purposes, everything is now switched to sort of single bit with serial. Single bit with serial, huh? And it just suddenly occurs to me to wonder, has anyone done CPU designs that work this way? Because that, that your, your wiring gets simpler very, very quickly. Uh, true, okay. Um... But I'm not sure, you know, um, in terms of the demonstrating of the clock cycles, okay, um, how, how hard uh, it would be, okay, to, to demonstrate that. Because imagine if you were to use just one bit, right, you probably got to use uh, more cycles, okay, to, to demonstrate the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, instruction. Uh, yes, yeah, so you'll have uh, you, your bus cycles and your compute cycles will, not, will no longer be in a one-to-one -one correspondence. Yes, yes, and 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 um, I would say the beauty of this this current build, okay, is to allow the user to you know manually pulse the clock and see how things move, and using a one bit uh, architecture, okay, might uh, not uh, deliver that point. Uh, yeah. no, you just, you'd still clock the uh, the highest frequency clock, the the yeah. the IO the IO clock. Yeah, but sure. Your, your CPU instructions would take uh, at, you know, at least eight times as many yep. uh, cycles yep. to happen, but it, but it would also 
drastically simplify your wiring. I mean, you know, you, it wouldn't divide it by eight, but it was certainly divided by about four and yep. cut your chip cut in half. So I <laughs> sort of wondering, it, it just, it really just occurred to me just now that this, the, the fundamental problem with creating a breadboard uh, micro CPU is that you've got to do all of this manual fiddly wiring. There's always one wire that's wrong. Uh, and so yep. being able to cut the wiring down by sort of 70 or 80% would very much simplify the, the task. It just suddenly occurred to me that the, the costs of doing so might actually be acceptable. If you, as long as you get in your head the idea that the I.O. clock and the compute clock are not the same anymore, which is true for all modern CPUs anyway, um, you would actually have a much simpler uh, design to build and, and need far fewer parts. Definitely. Anyway, just, sorry, just a random thought that yeah. I haven't thought through at length. just went, ooh, hey, it works for everything else. SATA, USB, uh, all of the modern bus standards, multi-lane yep. standards, all one bit wide times, times some number of lanes to go faster. So anyway. Well, okay. Thank you, Roland. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Maybe uh, Xavier can look at that. Um, next, uh, anyone? If not, we'll move on to uh, while King Ming set up, sets up. Uh, so let's, let's thank Xavier again. Uh, he's a, an accountant, by the way. He didn't want to mention that. <laughs> so maybe that's why he, he wants more lines. <laughs> 